In the EDC community, people tend to value these kind of utilitarian, rugged kind of themes, and the original Apple Watch doesn't really do much for that. And on some of the videos where I've looked at EDC kits, I've seen some comments, people suggesting that the Apple Watch is a little bit of an anomaly to the overall philosophy that I was looking at. I think the EDC community values freedom and choice, and I think Apple's walled garden can be a little bit of a turn off if that's the kind of thing that you really value. There is also a discussion to be had around Apple's approach to software and freedom. In short, though, I think my personal position on this really is that they're restrictive approach to software is actually a design-led choice. It's not one that's come through greed. And I know a lot of people will probably disagree with that. But I think when you look at the values that they really try and subscribe to when it comes to designing their products and their software, it's 100% about continuity through an interface. It's about precision and consistency. If they open things up a lot more and allowed customization and third-party integration in that software more than they do at the moment, I think they would really run the risk of actually diluting that user experience. And that's something I actually really value. I like the way they have given the designers the freedom to do what they do without risk of that then being later polluted down the line. The end result is the experience we get when we use these products is a really magical one, you know, with the aesthetic really taken into consideration and the overall usability of the things we do on them. In terms of EDC philosophy, we've got this idea of being prepared for anything and ready for adventure when we're choosing gear and designing kits. I actually have no problem embracing Apple's walled garden for the stuff that they do while still really valuing those EDC philosophies of utility and preparedness. So obviously if you know this, channel, you'll know that I'm really interested in the idea of convenience and workflow and how we can sort of save time with these day-to-day -day routines. And that's why I'm really interested in the Apple Watch, because it has this kind of convenience layer to it that allows you to do little tiny small things throughout the day in a way that's much more convenient than we could do before. Now, I've actually had the Apple Watch since the original one, and what it offers is really quite remarkable. And, but sometimes in a way that's quite hard to sort of articulate, if someone says, oh, you know, what, what would I get out of an Apple Watch if they haven't used one before? It's quite hard to sort of pin down quickly in a response to that question, all of the things that it actually does. So I tried to kind of summarize that here. I did a video where I looked at the idea of how I use my Apple Watch with a security camera for looking at the notifications, which gives me that real time feedback on the house, wherever I am in the world, to see if anything is going on and see if I need to phone the police, because obviously a police response is the only really meaningful solution if you're being broken into. So you need to know about it in real time and make that call. And then of course, I'm pretty into the whole smart home thing. So I've got lots of stuff and I can control all of that just through either Siri on the watch or the home app on the watch. So that's fantastic. And I've taken that to quite an extreme as well. I've done a video on that uh, where I've set up my car wash routine based on a pressure hose and then a separate deionized water hose, which is all completely controlled by Siri. So I can just do that from my watch on the driveway, which is an amazing thing. And of course, things as simple as looking at notifications to decide if they need actioning or not. That's actually quite a big deal. You know, every time you hear your phone ping, you haven't got to take it out of your pocket to check if it's something more urgent than not. Uh, with the watch, a glance will tell you whether you need to take action or not. But then there's things like the complicated on the watch face themselves. So that's really interesting. It's obviously very easy to kind of overlook the significance of that. But having your next event as part of your watch face, every time you glance at the time, you can see what your next event is or what action you've got to take from reminders. It's all just right there as part of the design of the watch face itself. And that is really something. So there's a whole range of things that you can put on here according to what kind of things you really value. So obviously events is an obvious one, but so is weather. But I've also got a complication on here that shows me if the car is locked and its battery state of charge as well. So that's super interesting. And I can actually just open the app from that complication to control my Tesla from the watch as well, which is a pretty mind blowing thing. And that has some pretty serious implications as well because it means I can go swimming in the sea. I don't need to worry about taking my wallet or my phone. I can just leave the watch on. I can come back and open it from there whether or not I would actually not take my card as a backup. Obviously, they're waterproof and so very small, so it's not a problem. Uh, but I, I may at some point just decide the watch is actually enough. And then there's Apple Pay, which is another one of these things you almost completely forget that it does, but you use it every time you're in the shop. And the whole biometric idea that it knows when it's on your wrist, so you don't have to authenticate with face or thumb or anything like that. But once it's on your wrist and it's unlocked, it stays that way until it comes off your wrist, which means when you go into a shop, double tap, you've got your card ready to pay. And there's no limit on there. And that's safe because it hasn't come off your wrist. So that whole idea is just amazing. It's it's unbelievably convenient to, to pay for things in shops once you've got an Apple Watch. And of course, being able to actually message and call on it as well just, just means you can go out and do something without taking your phone, but you know that people can get in touch with you in emergency situations and if, if the other way around as well. And then there's all the health tracking stuff, which is really fantastic. I love looking at the graphs and seeing the trends of what's going on with me breathing and, and the sleep tracking is, is amazing. You see this graph overnight where it tells you what stage of sleep you've got in 
attention to. And actually as an alarm clock on your wrist, it's brilliant because you can choose um, an alarm that's sort of more tappy and less noisy. And that's brilliant because it means I don't have to have a loud alarm clock that wakes everyone else up. It can just wake me up discreetly. It's funny when you start thinking about it, how many of these small little daily things you realize it's actually really useful for. Uh, and it's probably more that I've still missed even now, but you don't really remember them until you do them. In terms of design and utility though, the Apple Watch has always been a bit of a tricky one. I certainly feel like I am having to reject quite a big part of this kind of EDC philosophy that I really value uh, when I have this watch, but I'm, I'm happy to do that because of all the other stuff that it does offer. Obviously watches are a really personal subjective thing and people choose them heavily based on the kind of look that they want for them. If I didn't really value the overall smartwatch kind of software sensor based package that Apple have created here, I definitely wouldn't choose this watch based on its utility or its appearance. The problem with Apple watches is they are actually pretty delicate. The first one I had, the Apple Watch Sport, I think it was called at the time, I dropped it on the bathroom floor and it just smashed, the screen just smashed, it's so exposed, it's rounded off, it's the front part of the watch, totally vulnerable. And obviously being the cheaper one, it had the, the INX glass, which everything except for the really quite expensive ones even still has now. And I actually took it back to the Apple store and I said, you know, it's it's called an Apple Watch Sport. Shouldn't it be able to cope with being dropped from waist height? And you know, they didn't like that, but you know, you get the idea. Funnily enough, they did actually drop the Sport name in subsequent versions of the watch. You're reminded in a situation like that that those super cheap Casio watches would easily survive a drop like that. So you can get sapphire glass on the stainless steel Apple watch, but that puts the price into quite a serious category and is still totally exposed and rounded as part of the front of the watch. And then there's the battery life, which is the other kind of big part of this discussion when you're thinking about sort of EDC values of, of preparedness and adventure. I can't even take this for an overnight stay at my parents without having to take the charger with me, otherwise it'll be flat the next day. So that's a very small scale adventure and it can't even do that on one charge. And this rounded, smooth pebble design doesn't really scream adventurer either. I made the case in this other video where I think the Apple Watch Ultra is what I consider one of these convergence devices. So it replaces lots of other kinds of devices. And sometimes devices like that do what they're supposed to do and, and actually genuinely provide a product that does replace the need for separate ones. And other times, you, depending on the person and depending on what you want out of them, they don't kind of do that. But I think the Apple Watch Ultra really is one of those that for a lot of people can replace the, the kind of need for a watch like a Casio G-Shock or a dive watch uh, in terms of something that's super waterproof and, and quite stylish that reflects that sort of sense of style to it. And of course, all the dedicated fitness watches from Garmin, uh, it sort of replaces the need for a separate one of those. And when you look at it like that and you think if you were to think of terms of all of those watches, not any one of them would really work as a genuine everyday watch. It's almost like you might want a dive watch for your sort of day to day, and then you might want a Garmin for when you go on an adventure or something like that. The Apple Watch Ultra, I think you can look at a device that genuinely can just be used as a single watch. So when you look at it like that, I think you can kind of add up the cost of a dedicated fitness watch with a more stylish dive watch or something. You know, the pair of those you might switch between them. If you combine the price of those two, that starts to really make the Apple Watch Ultra look much more competitive in terms of price. So let's just run through some of the claims of the Apple Watch to see how it kind of feels in terms of what it's claiming it can do. It's got dual frequency GPS, which is supposed to be super accurate, especially in between tall buildings and things where normal GPS would start to lose its accuracy. It has battery life that claims to be actually good enough for things like triathlon triathlons and multi-day hikes. Now obviously it's interesting on devices this small where you're doing 100% to zero pretty much with the cycle of the life cycle of the battery. They do tend to wear out after a couple of years. Mine's I think two or three years old now. It's definitely not lasting as long as it used to. So if you are thinking of really pushing that battery capacity then you do need to think about the replacement cost for the battery which I think on the Apple Watch Ultra is about 100 pounds. But obviously you don't need to worry that it loses capacity after a few years because you can actually replace it. It's just something you need to be aware of in terms of the total cost of Ownership. And of course, if you don't really think you need the full three days of battery life and you're going to be charging it overnight anyway, it just means that you'll get more time out of it before you do need to think about replacing the battery. So it's got these three different straps that are specifically designed for different kinds of adventure scenario. And this is the point where it starts to get appealing in terms of that EDC philosophy. So we've got the Alpine loop, the trail loop and the ocean band. They all look great and they all come in some really nice colors as well. So that definitely sets it on the right tone, I think. The design of the case itself is really interesting. It's made of titanium. It's got the sapphire glass that actually it's flat and flush below the protruding titanium case. So, uh, you know, on paper, that sounds super tough. I can imagine it being genuinely tough. That's a very nice kind of design in terms of reducing scratches and impacts on the glass. And being titanium, it's got to be pretty solid. They tested it to a military specification. Now, this one is interesting because it sounds like they've almost had it tested and certified to some kind of brilliant military standard. It's actually not quite that straightforward. If you look on the Wikipedia page about this specification, it's basically, I think, available to any manufacturer that wants to claim they 
they've made a product that meets this standard. Um, they don't have to do it all or they can take their own interpretation of it or anything like that. So it is something that's a little bit looser than it perhaps first appears. Uh, but if you look at the uh, small print on the Apple page, they do explain which parts of the test that they've tested it to. So I think we can kind of generally assume it is going to be pretty rugged. Of course, we're waiting for some YouTubers with a bit more disposable revenue than I have to buy some of these and really smash them to bits and we can really see just how tough they are then. One of the best things about this watch, I think, is the night mode. So you can roll the digital crown and it goes into this red night mode. And it's always surprised me why we don't see more interfaces that utilize this red idea for use in the dark. So actually, I first just assumed this was something about your pupils dilating and red light didn't trigger that response or something. There's actually a lot more to it than that. It's actually on the retina level. So in the nighttime, after about two hours, your eyes adjust and it switches over from using cones for brighter uh, color vision to using the rods in your eyes for black and white night vision. So you can see much more in the dark, but you are only seeing in black and white. And the thing is, red light doesn't switch you back out of that mode as much as brighter white lights or blue lights or green. And it was used for lighting insides of submarines and things for the same reason. It's a fascinating kind of concept to think that this is how your eyes react. And it's amazing to see the Apple Watch taking advantage of this. The interesting thing is that makes it so significant in a watch is that it takes your eyes about two hours to adapt to the black and white night vision, but it's only a few minutes for it to get undone and go back to bright mode. So if you glanced at a watch that wasn't red and it was just a bright white light or a phone, then your eyes would undo all of that hard earned night vision and you'd have to wait another two hours for it to go back. So you can see the significance of having this on a watch. The flip side of this for use in the daytime is that the screen is insanely bright. Um, they're claiming 2000 nits, which is really bright. So it does seem to have genuine usefulness in real outdoor situations. The alarm is a cool feature, I think, that, that kind of just really does tap into that idea that you might find yourself in an adventurous situation and you get a bit stuck and the idea of having an alarm on your wrist is kind of cool. The other thing that I find particularly interesting about this design, the impact of having this the second button is not just obviously for allowing sort of quick access to something as a shortcut button. I think it has implications for use when you're wearing with gloves because obviously adding another button means you can design a bit more of a useful interface that can be fully controlled without interacting with the screen itself. So with the digital crown and the clicker on that and the other button and then this button, that's enough control to really start designing an interface that you can just use wearing gloves. And then we've got the microphone and the speakers. So this is a major upgrade where they're talking about two speakers, really loud and beam forming microphones to pinpoint your audio even in a howling gale this is just really cool because the, the one of the main usefulnesses of an apple watch is that you can use it for calls just sort of holding it like this you haven't got to hold it to your head or anything and you don't need to wear air, airpods or earpieces it's useful as a phone just like that but in obviously extreme weather that is going to fall down with the normal one. It's pretty loud, and obviously the microphone, you know, it's it's not a fantastic setup for extreme weather. So if they're claiming the Apple Watch Ultra can really deal with that, that's really interesting because what it's doing is taking the usefulness of the kind of format of the Apple smartwatch with the calls and everything built in, but actually making it useful in real world outside situations. The Wayfinder face design itself is also really interesting. I think uh, it's a great example of where Apple's restrictive approach to software design has allowed for something to be designed that actually actually really looks fantastic. With a product like this, I'm quite happy that Apple have been restrictive and stopped too much third party uh, messing about going on with this interface. The result is that there's actually a really cool mechanism, the complications mechanism, where third parties can expose themselves uh, inside the watch face design, but it's done in a way that doesn't detract away from the overall aesthetic for that. And I think that's really important. And what that means is every time you glance at it, you get that sense of gratification that you get when you see something that's been really well designed, um, especially if it's using a kind of design language that resonates with you uh, for the kind of values that you're expecting from the thing you're looking at. So this is a device that really positions itself using this aspirational kind of idea for anyone who fancies themselves as a bit of an adventurer. But it actually does seem to have some legitimate use for real life adventurers too. And at the same time, it offers genuine convergence utility in a package that is non-specific enough to have mainstream appeal for day to day use. Of course, the specialist devices will probably still outperform it, but not none of them have got the complete package that the Ultra has. So it has the ruggedness and battery life to put it into real utility territory here, but it has that adventure inspired sense of aesthetics to back it up as well. I think this could be a really seriously successful product for Apple. If you consider yourself a bit of an EDC enthusiast, let me know if this watch appeals to you. It certainly does to me, and I'm very interested to know if others in the EDC community kind of think the same way. If you watch this video next, you can see how I designed a pockets only everyday carry system, uh, which is quite an interesting video. Now I've actually since then evolved the whole thinking and I'm going to be doing a new video soon. So make sure you're subscribed for that as well. And I'll see you there.